Hearts fans, we were delighted to, and rather surprised perhaps, to find a new album from the band uh, called From a Page. And we're absolutely delighted to have one of the people principally behind this album, which is Oliver Wakeman with us today. Hello, Oliver. Hello. Great to have you here. So the re- this release then, From a Page, it must be a dream come true for you. How does it feel to have an official Yes studio album, which you were so integral in putting together? Uh, it means a great deal, actually. It was... um something that chris and i talked about a great deal on the 2009 tour we 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 had a tour bus usually around america we were driving everywhere or flying um but because of the geography around europe we hired a tour bus and i suffer occasionally with insomnia i don't sleep very well i stay up all the time and chris also stayed up rather late and so you know we'd be driving from one country to another and we'd both find ourselves just sort of the only two people left awake on the bus. And we just started talking about music. And Chris said, I'd really like to record a new album. Yeah. And we just kept talking about it. And it got, you know, we got more and more excited about it. And um, it, it just became the next focus for the band. And it, it, it really sort of cemented that lineup yeah. in our heads that we were going to become a recording entity. Uh, Steve was interested as well, was a a little more reticent at first because he wanted to ensure that we were properly gelled together Mm. and that it was the right stage for us to move on to, Uh, which is why we we sort of started doing it middle to to, to late 2010. Well, we got to the middle of 2010 after uh, Steve and I had met up on many occasions. We you know, he felt that it was the right time as well. And I had a, a lovely a lovely day where we, Chris came over to England and Chris, uh, Steve and I all met down at Steve's farmhouse yeah. and had a, a whole afternoon just talking about what we could do and listening to the, the demos and the ideas. Yeah. Um, and it, it, you know, then it, it really felt like a, a real thing. So when we actually got into the studio and it really started to happen, obviously I was, I was very, very pleased and very excited. And then obviously, you know, the stuff that everybody knows happens. And um, so it was, you know, it was, it was a bit disappointing that people didn't get to hear this stuff. So so when the opportunity presented itself, it felt, you know, it felt like I, I wanted to make it absolutely the best thing it could be. Uh, and also I wanted it to, you know, an opportunity for people to hear Chris again. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a very, very big fan of your father's and of your work. I'm a big uh, Wakeman supporter. So I'd like to ask you a little bit about your musical background. And one thing I've been very curious to ask you about is, what is your earliest memory of your father playing the piano? My earliest memory of him playing a piano is probably a lot later than people will think. Hmm. It is probably in about 1980, and I went to a show after my mum and dad had divorced. Hmm. And I went to a show with my nan, and his, his, his obviously dad's second wife, Danielle, was there. And I, and I remember thinking, as I must have been eight or nine, maybe a bit older than nine. And I remember watching Dad on stage and thinking, this is a bit weird, because it hadn't really <laughs> twigged with me up until that point. It had just been, you know, Dad was always away on tour, and I was with my mum. But I just think I could distinctly remember that for some reason, standing in amongst the crowd and everybody shouting and cheering. I think it was Hamas Methodian at the time. I think it's the Apollo now, but it's the Odeon at the time. Yeah. And I and I, I distinctly can remember that for some reason. And I remember watching him and sort of shouting out, "That's dad! That's dad!" At the age of nine or ten, whatever <laughs> it was. I'm getting older by the, as as the sentences go by, but no one's actually <laughs> asked, ever asked me that question before. That's why this is a nicely stuttered answer. But yeah, I think it's probably I think it's probably that we had a piano in the house when I was growing up. We had lots of you know stuff around the house, but that, a nice big grand piano that I used to go and sort of bash around occasionally, but that's the first time I remember sort of really watching it. I, I was at the Journey to the Centre of the Earth concert at the age of two, mm. but I don't remember it. No, no. <laughs> that would be quite impressive if you did. Um... <laughs> yeah, I've still got the T-shirt. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, they, got me a t-shirt. They, still, they got me a T-shirt when I was there, and I still have it in my cupboard. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, we were talking to Dylan Howe recently, uh, another one of the offspring oh, of, of the band, and yeah. uh, we asked him if he would describe himself as he was growing up as a Yes fan. So what about you as you were growing up? Were you a Yes fan? Um, yes, I think I probably was, but not in the, the standard way that people would, would think. Because Dad was always away on tour, mm. <clears throat> I didn't really have Dad around in the house sort of talking about Yes. And, you know, he, he left the band in 78. So mm. I was six when he first left mm. the band. Mm. 
so I didn't really, as a, as a sort of child, I didn't really follow the band at all. And I, I, my mum gave me a load of records. When I reached sort of teenage years, mm. my mum got a load of records out of the loft. And they were a load of uh, like A&M demonstrator records. And she oh. gave me this pile of records <laughs> and said, you might want these. These were your dad's. And yeah. there was, um, I distinctly remember it. And I've still got it to this day. And there's some, one of my favorite albums, actually, which is Off the Ball, which is Sticks is The Grand Illusion was one of them. Oh, yeah, and nice. And so she gave me that, and then she gave me Tales from Topographic Oceans, yeah. and that was it, I think, and maybe Going for the One. And, right. and, and so I had these records, and I always really enjoyed the records, and, and I started to get into it more. And then I started to listen to more and more things uh, as, they, as they came about. I mean, it was a long time to, till I heard um, Close to the Edge, but I think I went out and picked up Fragile somewhere, or I asked mm. my mum to get me a copy of Fragile, or Dad to send me a copy of Fragile. Mm. And really enjoyed that. And that was the one I sort of really liked. Uh, and then it's a bit of a weird, you know, it, you have to sort of, sort of partly understand the family history to understand why this sounds like, you know, dad was never around. It's because my mum and dad divorced when I was uh, sort of six, seven. Mm. Uh, and then dad lived in Switzerland for a long time. And when he came back with his, hit and met his third wife, which was Nina, that was, I was probably about 12, 13 at that point. And I remember distinctly, Dad talking about doing a show and he was going to go and play Journey to the Centre of the Earth. And I remember looking at Dad and saying, I've never heard that. And my, <laughs> you know, and Nina just looking at, at Dad and just saying, why, what happened? Your son hasn't heard this. And, and he, so he then sorted me out with a load of records to listen to. And then I really started to listen to things because, you know, he dug a load of stuff out for me. And I just listened to it over and over again. I mean, I, I'd always, I'd had um, No Earthly Connection, I think was another of the a and demonstrators yeah, that I yeah. had, which is why, why No Earthly Connection is probably my favorite album, because it was the one that sort of, uh, I always associate yeah. with dad and, and growing up. But I do remember becoming, you know, really liking this Yes music. But it was also a period of time in the 80s when I was growing up where prog rock wasn't really in vogue. And... Yeah. I remember being at school in the second and third years and being teased mercilessly about it because, you know, Duran Duran and Aha were in the top of the charts. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, and, and yes, and, and that weren't really that, you know, in vogue, particularly around school kids and teenagers. But then by the time I hit the sixth form, suddenly everybody started to grow their hair mm -hmm. and listen to more music. And then suddenly a lot of these people that used to be really quite nasty suddenly realized that actually these bands were quite cool. And then suddenly mm -hmm. everybody wanted to talk to me about it. And then I, I think that's when it sort of became more of a subject that I sort of chatted about with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fan fantastic. Just a side note, No Earthly Connection is an absolutely brilliant record. I love that album. Just a, a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about just really quickly. We did talk about, obviously, your earliest memory about your father with the piano. But what I'm curious about is also, what was it, what did, when was the first time you saw your father perform with Yes? Cool. Well, that's another good question. Um, when did I first him play with Yes? Uh, actually, I can tell you, it, was, um, it wasn't actually Yes, it was the ABWH tour. Uh, uh, in oh. eight, uh, I think that was probably 88. Yeah, I was, yeah. I 88, was 89. Yeah, 88, 89. I went with my brother. We, we flew over to America to watch some of the shows in America. Mm -hmm. And I distinctly remember that because Tony Levin was on bass. Mm -hmm. and, and so I watched the shows from the audience, and I think they did about four or five shows, and I was um, <clears throat> really enjoying it. And then Tony Levin got sick. Yeah, uh, and so they stopped. They stopped the tour, and in order to make use of the time and the fact that everybody was there, they went into the studio and did the uh, single version of "I'm Alive" from yeah. the ABWH album. Yeah, ah. and I, I distinctly remember that because I remember I. That's how I got to uh, become friends with Steve Howe because I sat in the studio with him when he was doing all his recording and all the new guitar parts for for "I'm Alive," and I spent a long time sitting in studios talking to him, and I, I can remember it so clearly. Dad would sort of be off chatting to people i'd be talking to steve howe and he'd be explaining to me about yes stuff and how he was doing things and showing me all his guitars because he had one of those little come and maybe the guitar is like a headless tiny little steinberger guitar. steinberger that's the one it was in blue i remember it and in the background there was dylan getting drum lessons from uh, bill bruford i just i can always remember it. i was thinking right so rick sonny's over here talking to the guitarist the guitarist sonny's over there talking to the drummer <laughs> It was it was a it was a weird day, but it's but that, I I remember that tour, so that would be in answer to your question. It was ABWH. 
Brilliant. So, I mean, let's take it on a bit, little bit further with Yes, then, and, and delve into it a bit further. Um, apart from your dad, who I'm assuming is your, your favourite, who's your other yeah. other favourite Yes keyboard player? Um, do you know what? Having done the tour, the In the Present tour, and then the follow-up ones, which were uh, right, Rites of Spring, and I think there's another one we did as well, to cover the name of that tour was, I kind of got to know how all of the players played and I, I really couldn't say I, I had a favourite amongst any of them I think they all played brilliantly and all came up with really interesting parts for the music that they were involved mm. with at the time yeah. and I, I think I, I did a video thing once a long time ago where people asked me to sort of talk about the different musicians and you know they all have such individual styles I've always said you know Jeff Downs is a very rhythmic sort of style of playing with a very clean approach to the, the chord structure he uses in songs uh, yeah. and I've always enjoyed his work that he did with the S and I, particularly Asia was probably where I knew a lot of Jeff's stuff from mm. when I was growing up in the 80s yeah. uh, and Tony Kay I really admired the way his, his approach to timing the way he does his sort of timing at the beginning of Yours Is No Disgrace mm. was really interesting um, uh, and, and the way Patrick Moraz approached chord structure and, and his, his fluent playing throughout Relaya was just was just great, you know. It's 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 really you know, if you want to really go into sort of deep stuff, you know, the way Trevor Raven would do some of the the keyboard parts on talk yeah. and sequence them and then loop them and play them, you know, all all technically different players, but you know, all great in their own way. And I I, I think that really adds to the the history of Yes because it, it it adds a different uh, different texture to each period. Yeah. Yeah. That's a politically correct answer, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, just 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 for the record, that uh, interview that you were talking about is actually the bonus feature on the Live in Lyon uh, DVD, where you speak about the different keyboard players and their styles. Oh, right. Yes, yes, yeah. I remember that. Yes, so uh, there's where uh, you, you that's where you spoke about it. Um, so um, my next question will be a lot more simpler. It won't be okay. as much of a head scratcher this time. I promise. Um, so. <laughs> So you, you go into the story of these pieces in depth on the sleeve notes, and we yep. both agree, me and Kevin, that these songs are absolutely brilliant, fantastic. And uh, oh, so, how about, so how about a little bit of uh, back info for the listeners who haven't read the sleeve notes yet? Uh, were these songs recorded with Trevor Horn during the Fly From Here sessions? Uh, what happened was is we went into the studio with, uh, with the songs. Well, basically, if I go back before we went into the studio... We did a writing session in Phoenix where, and before that, Steve and I and Chris had met up to talk through all these songs. So they gave me their ideas. I demoed them up and I wrote some songs of my own. And then Steve and I got together and would go through some of the pieces and come up with different ideas. And then when we went to uh, the studio, uh, Trevor Horn came on board. Uh, interestingly enough, I suggested that to Chris on one of our late 2009 tour bus conversations. Mm. He said, who should produce it? And I said, well, why don't you ask Trevor, Trevor Horn? I'm sure he'd like to work with the band again. <laughs> so so when Trevor came on board, he was obviously focused very much on the, the Fly From Here track. Mm. Um, and that, that's where his focus was. So when we started in the studio, he was he was working on that a lot. Um, and in the meantime, I was sort of in the, in the background, sort of setting up keyboards and doing different parts. And I managed to set up a sort of separate studio bit where I could start laying down these other tracks into into a form for us to work on. Because obviously, I'd done all the engineering and the demo work on creating these songs into this point. And one of the things that we used to do with Yes was when we recorded, it wasn't always to... Uh, it wasn't like a, a click track and then all the drums would go down and then a click track and all the bass would go down. We'd actually play together as a unit, the mm. old fashioned way. So mm. we would record everything. And that was primarily to get the drums, to get a really good feel of the drums so that Alan was playing with the band, not just with a click. Mm. And then we would keep some of those core parts and then replace other bits and then overdub and add and add, which is, which is why you end up with a, a sort of quite a nice yes sound. So that's, that's how we started doing that, that recording. And then Trevor would disappear back to the UK for a period of time to go and work on some other projects. And while he was away, the rest of us would continue to work on the pieces that, that we'd written. So, you know, the songs that were there before Trevor was, was there was, you know, Steve had two, which was Hour of Need and Don't Take No for an Answer. And Chris had The Man You Always See In Me. Uh, and then we had Into the Storm that we were working on. And then we had these these four songs from the From a Page record. So that's that's how the recording sessions worked. 
And I just want to take a slight detour now from the, the music because I'm holding in my hands the the box set from a page of yes. Studio Tracks Plus in the present life from, from Leon. And I, I, I've got to ask you about the amazing, as, as it always is, Roger Dean, yeah. <laughs> the artwork is fantastic. And uh, yeah. I love the front cover and I love the back cover. And I know on Twitter you've been having a little, a little conversation about the back cover there, which is a completely separate and different Roger Dean painting. And there are yeah. bridges on it. And there are these five uh, little characters and then two little characters off towards the side. And I know that you've, uh, that you've not necessarily uh, uh, defined exactly what's going on there, but I think there is a story behind that, isn't there? Yeah, well, Roger, <clears throat> when Roger and I were talking about the cover, because originally this whole project came about because I, I probably need to jump back a little bit, which it doesn't actually answer your question, but gives a little bit of background behind the story. Yeah. Originally, these tracks... I originally mixed the track The Gift of Love at Home because basically I, I hadn't... Sorry, this is going to be a complete diversion, but I think it makes sense to the, the whole story of how the, 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 the images came about. Yeah. After I left the band, obviously, you know, I didn't really have a lot to do with Yes for a period of time. I went off and uh, toured with Gordon Giltrap, uh, yeah. the guitarist, for about two or three years, and we did an album together called Ravens and Lullabies. Mm-hmm. And when I left Yes, the one thing they said is they said they sent me, they said, you, you, you know, obviously we're not going to use your songs. We're doing Fly From Here with Trevor and Trevor's songs. Yep. So have them back. And I went, OK. And then in the post arrived um, <clears throat> three DVDs of the sessions that we'd recorded. Nice. And I just thought, oh, great, and put them on a shelf and didn't think about them. Yeah. And then a, a few years later, I wrote to Chris. So I heard he wasn't well and it had been a long time. So I wrote him a an email and just said, I'm oh, sorry to hear you weren't well. And he came back and, and said, you know, great, nice to hear from you and stuff. And you know, he'd written to me a few times after I, I, I left the band and, you know, quite personal emails, which were quite nice, which I, I probably won't go into on the radio, but they were, they were nice yeah. emails. And then I left it at that. And then I, I just, I was about to move house. And for some reason, I was packing everything up and I thought, you know what? I've never listened to Live in Leon. I just never listened to it. I, I did all <laughs> the work on it. I did all, I worked in the studio and mixed it and produced it and put it all together. Yeah. Um, because we finished the tour and the tour manager said to me, who's going to mix the live album? And I said, well, who do you want to do it? And he said, we don't know. The band never really you know, paid much attention to live music because they've, they've done so many live albums. Mm. You know, they, they just give the taste to somebody and they sort it out. And I said, well, I'd really enjoy doing that. Mm. So let me have all the hard discs. And I went back and went through everything and, and worked in the studio and put live and Leon together. Mm. So, I did it, and then it got delivered after I left the band. So when I, when I got the samples, they, they were great. They sat on my shelf, and I you know, wasn't really that interested in listening to them. Uh, but for some reason on this day, I thought, you know what? I've never listened to Live and Leon. So as I was packing everything up in the studio, I put Live and Leon on. Mm. And I was really enjoying listening to it. And I thought, oh, this is, this is pretty good. And I went downstairs, and my laptop was on the table. And I opened up my laptop, and there was an email from Paul Silvera, the tour manager, and I opened up the email, and it, it, it was the one that telling me that Chris had died that morning. Nice. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was like, wow. And I could hear, you know, Chris upstairs playing on live and live from Leon. Yeah. And that made me go, oh, that's that's really really sad. And it, you know, it sort of hit me a bit. Yeah. And so I, and then I seen well, moving house. So all the stuff that happens with moving house. And then when I got to the new house, I, I set some keyboards up, and I thought, Do you know what, I'm going to look at that track, The Gift of Love. And I just opened it up, and there were sort of loads and loads of session files, loads and loads of takes, loads of bits and pieces. And it took me quite a long time to sort through everything, pull everything together and, and sort of pull it into a shape. And then I added some more vocal bits and some keyboard bits and just spent some time really pulling it together into a, a nice track. And I had that track sort of in a rough mix for a couple of years. And it just, it was just, it was almost like a gift to myself just to remind me of what we'd achieved in the studio, even if no one else was ever going to hear it. Mm. At least this way, I would know that I'd done it. Yeah. And and over time, you know, I did the same to, to the other tracks. Uh, and then I, obviously, I tweeted about these, these tracks and the Yes Management got in touch with me and said, oh, can we, you know, can we have a chat? So anyway, there's a whole other story to that, which I won't go into it for this question or for this answer. But essentially, when we got to the cover, I, the management said, look, do you, you know, do you want to speak to Roger? Because um, they'd said about who was going to do the, the design of the, the artwork for the, for the box set. And I, in my, you know, the very few minutes that I get free in the day, I do graphic design stuff. I used to, I did college at, I was art college and did graphic design, right. as lots of musicians do. And so I was putting all the cover together. I thought, you know, I'd really quite enjoy doing that. 
And so I spoke to Roger a lot, and he said, look, I've got an image for the front cover that I think would be really, really nice. It's, yeah. it's a bit different to the usual Yes covers. And he sent it to me, and I just looked at it, and I thought, that's great, because mm. it's so it's so beautiful. But in simplistic is the wrong word. It's It, it breathes. Yeah. There's a lot of space as opposed to lots mm-hmm. of things going on, which yes. I really liked. Mm-hmm. And then we were talking about it, and I said, that's, that's terrific. And then I said, do you know what would be really interesting would be, you know, some figures somewhere on the painting. And he said, he said, well, he said, I can't, you know, so I can't go back and repaint the picture. And he said, how about we come up with something for the back, something new for the back? Yeah. <clears throat> and I, and I didn't believe for one minute that Roger Dean would just turn around to me and turn around and say, hey, this new project you do, do you want me to paint you something completely new? <laughs> uh, and I sort of went, yeah, I'd love to. And he said, what ideas do you have? And I said, well, I really liked on the back of Leon that you put five figures, mm. um, and I always and they were in groups of three and a group of two. And I said it really felt like that there were, you know, me and Benoit and the other three guys, and we were we were coming together. Mm. And I sort of talked talk, talked about this idea of these these characters then being in the next this album as well, so that it carried through from Leon. Yeah. Um, and then I talked about the idea of having two extra figures, and people can interpret that whichever they they want to. Could it yeah, be, yeah. you know, audience? Could it be? me and Benoit coming from the side to replace <laughs> Dad and John, or could it be Trevor and Jeff coming to replace me and Ben? You know, yeah. people can interpret it whichever way they could, but it also seemed to tie in with that feeling that this was a, you know, a period in their history, and then more people come and take over and carry it on for a while, and then though someone else will leave and someone else will come in and keep the whole thing going. Mm. So that's yeah. that's the story behind that, but it all comes from that thought about when Chris passed and just thinking, Do you know what, these figures are really important that shows people coming and going and people passing and people still being here. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. so that's that's a sort of convoluted answer to your question about why are there people on the back. But... <laughs> fantastic answer, actually. So you did bring up Benoit, which is fantastic. So I think it would be a crime not to mention Benoit. It's great to have Benoit's vocals on another yeah, studio album. Um, how yeah. is he doing now? And how involved was he with this album? Uh, Benoit retired from music back. Oh, after, well, he finished the um, the tour back in 2012, where his voice, you know, was 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 mm-hmm. quite damaged from the amount of work that he'd been doing with it. Uh, I was very lucky when I when I obviously when I left, I went off and did this album as I mentioned with with Gordon Giltra. And one of the tracks on this CD is is from the Turn of the Card, which yeah. was originally written on Benoit's guitar in yeah. an apartment that we shared in uh, Los Angeles when we were recording. Mm. Um, and it never, we never actually got to record all the parts in the studio for Yes, but I had the song and I, I thought, oh, I'm going to do something with that song. So I, I put it on the Ravens and Lullabies album, rearranged it more for the band that was in that album. Uh, but then I thought, well, it was written on Benoit's guitar and it was written for Benoit to sing. So I'll see if Benoit will sing it. So Benoit sang it for me on that album. And then yeah. obviously he had this, this vocal, this respiratory problem as well, which stopped him from, from singing. And I, I think since then, he hasn't done anything. So I, I heard from him the other day. Uh, well, actually, right at the beginning of the project, I wrote to him and said, look, this is, this is what I'm doing. You know, are you happy with me doing it? Uh, and he, he just came back to me and he said, absolutely. He said, I want, I want people to hear what, what we did before, you know, before Trevor came on board and, and, and took the band in a different direction. Yeah. Yeah. So he was, he, was, he was very supportive of that. And then, um, you know, I wrote to him a couple of other times. But I didn't sort of keep him involved with different mixes and updates and everything. I just, I did it and then sent him a copy in the post and he just wrote back to me the other day and he said he loves it. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was good. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we, we both love it as well. Um, played yeah. it multiple times since uh, receiving it. Um, just, oh, that's good. Just on the, uh, the, the Fly From Here topic, obviously you must have a, a bit of a complicated relationship with that record. But what, yes. do you, what do you think of Fly From Here Return Trip? Have you listened to that? I've listened to a few bits of it, but not, I'm not in great detail. It's, not, it's nothing against the band, but it's not a, a, a period of time that I tend to reflect on a great deal. No, no, I can understand that completely, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have a question that I've, I've always dreamt about asking your father this, but the next best thing is obviously to ask you, since you guys are so similar in style and, you know, <laughs> even, even in, even in humour, I find you guys are very similar, which is fantastic. Here's a question for you. If you were put on a desert island and could only bring two keyboards with you, which would you bring with you? Oh, that's a really tough one. Um, <laughs> what keyboards would I take? Well, at the moment, I have 
to the side of me, I have a lovely um, Dexabel Viva H7, which is a beautiful piano. Um, mm-hmm. I did some endorsement for them. Uh, and it is a, a lovely piano, and I use it for all my writing at the moment. So I'll probably take that one because it's, it's done a lot of music with me, and it's beautiful to look at, and it's got a lovely sound to it. So I really enjoy that one. And I would probably take my Moog Little Fatty because ah. it's been everywhere with me, and I love it. It was a, it was a, it did the job brilliantly on all the Yes tours. It still sat behind me. I, I obviously in the world of virtual keyboards, you know, you don't need as many keyboards in a room anymore. But that thing never, never goes away from my little studio. It's always there because whenever I have to do a Moog solo, even if I'm using a virtual Moog sound or something, I still plug it through the little a little fatty so it has yeah. the right feel and the right approach is that the same uh moog that you had when you went on tour of uh, that i saw in various youtube clips like when you guys played at the house of blues is that the same moog you're talking about uh it could be yeah it'll be the, it'll be the one from the house of blues i had two of them i had a this one was the um stage and then i had the stage two as well one had a silver back and one had a black back but the, uh. the black back one got stolen unfortunately when i was on in south america on tour so i only have the silver back one left now but that was the first one i bought so that's the one that stays with me everywhere fantastic brilliant and speaking about live still coming to the close to the end of our questions but we we uh, really like in in the present as as we've already spoken about live in uh, live from leon um but which yes songs did you most enjoy playing live when you were playing live with yes different songs for different reasons i really enjoyed playing close to the edge mainly because of the complexity of it it's mm. such a long piece to get through and actually you know, you, you have to really keep your concentration all the way through it. So I really enjoyed it when we played that. I really, oddly enough, I really enjoyed playing Perpetual Change. It's not on mm. Live from Leon, but we played it on the Rights of Spring tour mm. because there's a whole section, of course, where it merges from one part of a timing to another, that which they yeah. did with studio, studio stuff. And then we had this way of doing it live that was just great fun. You had to really control what you were doing and really think it through. But it was such great fun to play. And I, I just remember doing that one and thinking, this is fun. And I think also that one sticks in my head because it was one of the first newer songs that we put into the set after we'd played a lot of songs across yeah. you know, different, different shows. So when Perpetual Change came in, that was, that was really good fun. I, I enjoyed all of it. Mm. Well, in all honesty, there was you know, obviously certain sections. Heart of the Sunrise was, was always, uh, I think it's possibly one of the most challenging pieces that Yes do. Mm-hmm. Uh, the parts are quite uh, are quite fun to play and they're a bit tricky in places but they're fun but I think it's the thing that's heart of the sunrise is, is so interesting is the arrangement the way that you'll be playing a part and then you go to another part but then you'll play that same part again but you won't do the next part again you'll put something else in between it mm-hmm. and it just jumps between different sections and that was always really you got a real feeling of satisfaction when you got to the end of that track and you know you'd, you'd hit all your, your, your markers exactly right. That was that was really nice. And, you know, when all five of us just hit everything yeah. on, 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 the, yeah. on the button, that, that was a nice feeling. And I think we actually got that on, on um, Live from Leon. I think we did, it was quite a good version on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So um, here's my last question for you, Oliver. Um, your piano playing is absolutely wonderful. It's one of the reasons why I enjoyed these new songs so much. I think that your piano playing is one of your real strengths as a keyboard player. Um, and your, oh, and your you. style is and your style is very similar to your father. I'm curious, did he ever sit down with you and teach you when you were younger, or is this just natural piano talent? But, no, n- not once. No, we never sat down at the piano together. I think we've only ever sat next to each other at a piano three or four times ever the first time we ever played together was a launch for one of my albums in 2005 where we just got up on stage and jammed a bit with me but no we never sat at the piano together and he never showed me anything i always used to you know i remember i was about 12 or 13 i said to him, oh dad how'd you do this and he said work it out <laughs> and i said well, and so what he said he said that's how you learn you sit down you listen to things you work it out uh, and i sort of thought at the time, I remember thinking, oh, great, thanks. But, you know, it was, it was a good piece of advice. It sounds harsh, but it's it's a good piece of advice. I, I have the same, I like to say the same conversation, but it's actually like the same argument with my son. Because, of course, <laughs> nowadays he has access to everything on YouTube and MIDI files and everything where they can just find everything separated immediately. Mm. Whereas, you know, there's a certain challenge of listening to something, pressing stop, going back, listening to it again, yes. going round and round and round, trying to work it out. Yeah. That's how I worked out the yes set. I had to sit there and listen to the records and just go through and work everything out on paper. 
yeah. and then just yeah. just learn it. So no, so he never, never never taught me. But you know, Dad's always been quite open with that as well. You know, I think he's yeah. you know he's he's quite open that you know if you if you really want to do something and you want to be good at something, you you have to put the hours in. Um, and you know, and I enjoyed doing that. Mm. Yeah, fantastic, absolutely. Okay, well, we're both absolutely delighted that From a Page now exists as part of the Yes canon, and we, we really like it. But before we, we finish, we must let you talk about uh, one of your brand new projects, which is, is it Trinity? Tell us about that. Yeah, it's Trinity. That's interesting. That's um, Rodney Matthews' album. Rodney Matthews, mm. the, the world-famous fantasy artist who um, done covers for oh, all manner of bands, Praying Mantis, Magnum, lots and lots of those AOR bands he's done. I first um, saw Rodney's artwork on the Lord of the Rings by Bo Hansen album back nice. or when I was much, much younger. Yeah. Uh, and I was at, when I was at art college, I was my tutor came to me and said, "Who are you going to do as your um, your subject for your uh, final year exam?" And mm. we had to do a presentation and a, and a, and a, a I suppose it was a sort of an essay and, a, and a, a, a presentation on artists that we admired and people were doing the usual things of picking Monet or you yeah. know think yeah. Turner stuff like that. And and she looked at me and she said, "You're probably going to do Roger Dean, aren't you?" <laughs> and I remember thinking. <laughs> No, I'm not. And I remember thinking that guy that did the Bo Hansen cover, yeah. Rodney Matt, I loved his stuff. Yeah. So I, uh, I think Dad knew him. So I, I, I said I wrote to him. I wrote to Rodney and said I'm, I'm doing my art diploma. Would you, would you help me out with my thing? Mm. Uh, and he sent me two of his books wrapped in a poster and a handwritten letter. <laughs> and um, I remember thinking, well, wow, that's really nice. And I did my my thing and I, I passed and got a merit and, and passed my diploma because of you know his 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 help yeah um and then fast forward about 10 15 years later and i was doing the album jabberwocky with clive nolan yes. and um we needed a cover for it and i said look I, I know rodney matthews and i phoned up rodney and he said i've just finished the painting of jabberwocky it's just going into a gallery right. next week right um and so that ended up as the cover and we sort of stayed in sporadic touch from then yeah um and then actually probably just about a year or so before chris died i got a phone call from rodney just saying i, I you know he'd been working on these tracks with a guitarist in america for years because not, not many people know that rodney you know he's a very accomplished drummer and he played for many years um with bands uh, alongside doing his fantasy work at the, at the, be right. at the beginning of his career yeah. he mm -hmm. even yeah. played at glastonbury and he even actually was in a band that supported yes at one point oh, um gosh. and and so so he spent some time working with this guitarist in uh, America over maybe about 10 years, just coming up with ideas and songs and riffs and bits and pieces for each of his images. Mm. And then he got me involved. He said, oh, would you play on one of the tracks? And I said, yeah, of course I can. So he came to my house and we sat down with a bunch of keyboards. And I, because of the way I, I like arranging and I, I, I enjoy developing pieces i said no it's a really nice piece but you know what about if you did this here and what about if you you added some extra keyboards there and what about if you cut that bit out because that's that's kind of going around a few too many times there and i started to sort of get involved with the song and he, he sort of sat there and sort of a bit blindsided as i put keyboard after keyboard down and he said well what about a solo so i did a solo for him and he, and he sort of went oh that's, that's great thanks and then i burned him a cd and he lived in wales at the time and he said his drive home he just listened to it and he phoned me up the next day and said that was that was remarkable um the whole thing just watching you work and and the result he said would you do another one for me mm -hmm. and i said yeah yeah i'd love to and so it happened like that and in the end i ended up doing nine of the ten tracks on the album wow. um and then he he i think i think today to the nine and then he got he got married he was um he's engaged to a lady and they decided to get married and he asked me whether i would play at his wedding so mm -hmm. i i flew up to scotland and i played the piano uh, in the church for them yeah. uh, and then the organ uh, and then i played a, a piano show in the evening for a, a, a private party um, and my wife and I were trying to work out what we could get Rodney and Sarah, his new wife, for their wedding present. And, you know, I thought they, Rodney probably doesn't a picture and he probably doesn't need a gravy boat. So what can I do? So, so I wrote them a piece of music and I recorded it and put it on a CD in their card for them. And then at their, this present piano um, evening... I performed the piece for them for the first time and nobody had heard it before. Yeah, and yeah. as I finished this piece of music, it was called November Wedding. Right. And as I finished this piece of music, Rodney looked at me and he went, that's going on the album. <laughs> and so the nine <laughs> songs became, became 10. And then when they, they put the album together, you know, Rodney said, this is, this is, this is lovely. He said, it's, you're so involved with it. It, it. it doesn't just feel like mine and Jeff's album anymore. 
and I said, but I said, yeah, but I'm, I won't know all the way through it. And then he said, well, how about we do it? I, I think we talked about how it worked with my Three Ages of Magic album. It, that was with Steve Howe, rather than Oliver and Steve Howe. Mm. Oliver Waitman and Steve Howe. Mm. Steve always said, you know, he said, I've made a contribution to it, but it's your record, and I'm helping and bringing it to life. So I feel like a with co- contribution is, is a, a nice title. So mm. I suggested that to Rodney, and he said, yeah, that, that works. So it's actually Rodney Matthews and Jeff Sheets with Oliver Waitman. And then when they came to do the vinyl, Rodney phoned me up and he said, we need an extra piece for the vinyl. Any, any thoughts? And I said, well, November Wedding was originally written as a piano piece. Mm. And I said, but I'm putting that piano version on, on a solo album that I'm going to be working on. And I said, maybe I could do a different version for you. So I then sat down and, and played the piece twice uh, and did it as a piano duet. So the vinyl version has a, a piano duet version uh, as well. So it's going to be a, a lovely album. It, I mean, I've, I've listened to the test pressings, which which sound sound lovely, and the music's mainly instrumental, but it's it's just it's got a real proggy feel to it, and the music, you know, matches his imagery perfectly, and, and that comes out. I think it's end of November, very early December. But before that, we've got another single coming out. We've done a Christmas uh, single together, oh, yes. Yes, I, I which is that. Um, yeah. yeah, that's not a jump on the band wagon let's do a christmas single um type thing and this is actually what rodney does is each every couple of years he paints a picture to do um christmas cards right uh, so what he does he does a pack of christmas cards and as part of that he likes to use that as a, a way to um do some music so you buy a box of the christmas cards and the christmas cards can have cds in them so you're giving somebody a card and a gift at the same yeah. time yeah and he wanted to do the same again this year so that comes out in mid-november um, I, you know, just told him we, we've got to get that done in time for people to to get the cards out yes. at Christmas time. So, so he's he's been great. I mean, I love I love working with with all these super talented creative people. Whether it's Steve, Alan, Rodney, you know, they're all they're all great people to work with, and they just they they inspire you to to go the extra mile and just put the extra bit in to to do something justice, mm. like from a page, something like that. I think originally there was you know when the when it was first announced which was great fun doing it as a surprise announcement yes. um <laughs> yeah when it was first first announced i think people were wondering whether it was just going to be you know some some sort of demos or yeah. bits of unfinished pieces of music that we were just mm-hmm. sort of putting out there so uh, i was determined that these things should stand up against other yes music and actually feel like part of a studio collection of music rather than demos that should be on the end of an album sure certainly does yeah yeah that's absolutely. good well that's what i was waiting for you to say yes <laughs> <laughs> it does very much feel like yes music to me absolutely right and so listen oliver thank you very much indeed for from a page and thank you very much for your stories and and, and chatting today it's been an absolute delight so thank you very much oh absolute thanks for calling